everyone. Welcome to The Finance Story, and I'm your host, Vishal Krishna. We're a leading digital publication that celebrates and captures life in finance. Our series titled Finance 2022 and Beyond, powered by Capita, aims to inspire young and old CEOs and employees alike about this new world order that has emerged thanks to COVID-19. This realignment, however, presents a world of opportunity for us uh, in business. Digital is the name of the game and the role of finance has also changed along with it. Today, financiers and finance professionals need to look at a world that has converged onto the smartphone uh, while our industry continues to grapple with physical legacy. Today, we have with us Raja Lahiri, partner, Grant Thornton Bharat. His role at Grant Thornton Bharat is national TMT sector leader and IPO advisory leader. In the past, he was with KPMG, and Raja completed his CA in 1997. Welcome to the show, Raja. How are you? Well, thank you very much, uh, first of all, for inviting me, Vishal. I think uh, I'm, I'm doing good and great to be on your show, Vishal. You know, at the finance story, right, we often want to go back to the backstory of an individual and understand why finance, why CA, you know, what influenced you to take that career in finance? For well, sure, Vishal. Uh, you know, uh, first of all, you know, these are my personal views, right? I'm, I'm talking about in, 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 in terms of my personal capacity, not really views of the firm. I have to give you that caveat to start with. Uh, but, you know, to be candid, you know, when I look back into my, uh, my career and profession, uh, very honestly speaking, I never actually wanted to be a chartered accountant, right? My actual passion was, was actually in sports. Uh, that that's that that was the kind of focus that I had, and and in fact uh, there was a stage in my uh, education career when I actually literally had to choose between sports and uh, continuing my education. Uh, in fact, I, uh, I I I captained the school cricket team, and I was I represented the state in cricket. And it was actually going in that direction because, as you can Which imagine, year was this? Uh, was this under nineteen, under twenty five? Uh, no, uh, actually, was it, was it it Bengal. Was, yeah, it was for Bengal. It was for Bengal. Uh, it was actually under uh, under fifteen when I was selected, and I'm not going to tell you the name, but a uh, little bit I captained uh, somebody who finally represented Indian cricket. Uh, so I was not that not that bad in, in cricket at that point of time. So you were a batsman. That's amazing. A bowler. Uh, no, I, I, was a, I was a batsman, but and a first change bowler. That, that's what, what, I, what I used to do. Well, things uh, changed, you know, and, and I would say really, I would really contribute that to my father. Incidentally, I also come from a business family. Uh, and, and, and my father basically said one thing which stuck to me, which said that if you want to be a sports person, cricketer, journalist, uh, or even a doctor, uh, or even run a business, the one thing that you really, really need to know without which you cannot do any of this thing is finance. Even if you do the research or science, you need funds. So, and I think that word, uh, stuck to me, even though, as I said, I was not passionate, uh, but that stuck to me. And uh, again, I would say uh, my mother gave me the focus, uh, the learnings of focus, concentration, and determination, and that whatever you do, you got to do it very well. And I think the journey happened that incidentally, my father, you know, and I'm sure that that's, that, that's really what parents do, they got introduced to me some very different profile chartered accountants and they were already CAs and I met them and I figured out uh, that they are quite an inspiration the way they, they conduct themselves, their thought process. And I would say, truly speaking, that was the time I said, you know, I, I, I want to pursue chartered accountancy. Uh, and of course, my father also said, look at people around you. Kumara Mangalam Billa, for example, is first a chartered accountant right? And then an MBA. Uh, and he gave me lots of examples of CAs who have done well, including uh, some filmmakers in India who are actually chart accountants. So that, that got me going. Uh, and, and, and that's where I landed up doing my uh, articleship 
uh, I did my CA articleship and training. Uh, those days it was with uh, Lovelock and, and, and Lewis, and that's really where my CA journey started. How was your articleship like? Uh, curious about it. I mean, those days, uh, did, did, you, did you manage to learn a lot while you were on the job? Uh, what are some of the experiences that you want to bring out? Uh, the very fact is some people do a BCom and an articleship together. Uh, how did you manage uh, uh, two degrees and you know this, uh, this particular practice of yours, how different was it at the time? I remember, you know, that, that the person I referred to, the inspiration, the CA role model that I had, and he said very clearly, take articleship very, very seriously. So learn, this is your opportunity. What I learned during articleship, I actually understood uh, how organizations run. What is business? And I still remember I was auditing one of the leading power companies in India, power sector companies in India, where I actually learned how power is, is produced, sold, and then how does it record in the financial statements? So, so I would say there was a tremendous learning around business, number one. And I think the second thing I, I could relate to, and again, going back to, I think, two individuals, I would say, uh, that was, I, I think I was very fortunate uh, to learn from them. Uh, one was Shamal Mitra, who was a managing partner of Lovelock those days, uh, and Usha Narayanan, who was a senior partner of Lovelock, where I worked directly. And, and, and I think from there, I learned things around understanding business, sharp analytical skills, right? Uh, listening, right? You go to first listen to the client and then, then, then decipher what's going on. So the ocean of learning to be candid, I, I did. And I still remember, you know, an incident uh, which, which, which I did a training, and I still remember a managing partner saying, if you want to audit a paint business, you first got to understand how does a paint industry work? What is seasonality? When sales go up, sales go down? Because it's only when you understand the industry and the sector dynamics, that's only where you can do your job of auditing when, for example. So I think that stuck on uh, to me. I would say finally, I would say, uh, again, some, some senior person told us uh, behavior, how you behave with your peers in front of clients defines you. So the importance of good conduct, if I may say, uh, I think left an indelible impression on my mind. Now that's a fantastic introduction to the beginning of your career. You joined auditing in 1997 and uh, the, the career has been two decades or more now, and I, wa I want you to, to talk about those, those leadership changes for you that happened. You were in Calcutta, then you are in Bangalore now. How did that shift happen, not just in terms of cities, but you also changed as a leader or leading up to your grand taunted time. It's almost been a decade now, right? I wanted to hear about that experience of being a CA early part of your career. Like you said, some of your seniors said you have to learn about the industry before you audit them. Uh, how did you uh, prepare that career path to leadership uh, all the way up to Grand Thornton in this decade? Over to you. Well, sure, Vishal. Uh, means I guess, you know, it's always often said that what you don't want, you get. What you want, you don't get. Right? So very similar thing happened to my career as well. Uh, to be candid, I was absolutely clear after I passed my CA that I want to join the industry. Because as I said, I love business, right? I come from a business family. I love the intricacies and the uh, pulse of business. I want to feel that. So my first port of call was industry. In fact, my first offer actually was from the Tata Group. Uh, and, and I was very excited to join that. And I guess uh, that's when my father again came and said that, hey, it's good to join the industry, but why not the profession, right? Because profession allows you to get a view about all varied industries and gives you a very different perspective. Because mind you, I'm just a CA, right? I'm just still learning. So that's when I guess it was by chance that I got an interview at KPMG. I was selected. Uh, KPMG those days was just starting off in Calcutta. 
And mind you, those days, nobody knew what KPMG was. Where have you joined KPMG? Oh, is it ABCD? What is it actually? So I joined there, right? And believe me, it was a complete sea change of experience that I went through, completely sea change. Interestingly, my first assignment was not audit, even though I joined the audit practice. My first assignment was actually doing a due diligence for uh, advertising multinational, which was a, planning to acquire a business in India. It was a due diligence. Uh, so that was a great experience uh, for me. Uh, and again, I was swimming because I had never done a, a due diligence. Uh, so, so it was a lot of learning uh, that happened. And, and during the KPMG years, I think uh, there was a lot of hard work involved a lot of hard work, long, many nights. Uh, but I think a couple of things stood. And I, again, I would like to remember my mentor was Devashish Dasgupta, who was the head of our uh, Calcutta office. And he, I think, gave me a lot of learning of good project management. If you have to handle an assignment, you need to have good project management skills, right? Apart from just technical skills. So you got to think about timelines, you've got to think about your client, you've got to think about your team, and you've got to think about your deliverables. So good project management skills. And uh, I think that's what I learned. And to be candid, you know, it was, it was, it was a lot of great companies that I got exposure to be, uh, to be auditing there. Uh, I was doing fine. Uh, in fact, I was supposed to go to New York uh, for a secondment at KPMG and things changed in 2001. 9-11 happened in front of my eyes and my international secondment got called off. And finally, I joined Transaction Advisory Services as one of the founding team members of, of the practice at KPMG. And that's when I shifted to uh, Bangalore uh, from, from Calcutta. And, 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 I, and, and I still remember, uh, and I said, what a horrible decision I had made, right? Because I just recently had got married and in audit, I had a great portfolio. And you can imagine in a service industry, your chargeability is very important. I had a 99% chargeability. And here I was, I landed in Bangalore. I had no work, zero work because uh, the dot-com bust had happened. So there was no transactions, there was nothing. And I figured I didn't know what to do. And I was a manager those days uh, and I guess, Again, I think that for me was a tipping point, right? Because when you have nowhere to go, you really have to do something. And that's, I guess, uh, again, I learned from my mentor, which was Vikram Uttam Singh, who was the founder of the KPMG's transactions practice. Uh, he helped me to go to the market. So meet clients, understand deals, ideate deals, you know, from an audit, which is very process driven. Here in a practice, you've got to create create transactions, understand businesses, get clients. It's a very different role I got into. And I think those years till I, you know, spent 14 years at KPMG, it was really into transactions. So I did around 250, 300 transactions in those uh, decade from 2001 to 2011. Uh, and really, you know, private equity, venture capital, uh, cross-border, and very honestly, Vishal, I think I really consider myself very fortunate and I'm grateful that I got that experience. Uh, then a different opportunity opened for me, uh, which was Grant Thornton. Uh, Grant Thornton was an upcoming firm. And as you can imagine, I lived my heart out for KPMG for 14 years. And that was a big change for me when I uh, decided to move to Grant Thornton. But again, Grant Thornton was a different completely different role and milestone because I was asked to lead transaction services in Bombay. And that's when actually my work travel started from Bangalore to Bombay. So every week I was in Bombay, the weekends in Bangalore. So you can imagine my, my, my life completely changed 360 degrees. Uh, I guess in Grand Thornton, uh, the exposure was really about creating something. It was, it was in some capacity, I would say a startup, 
right? Remember I said in KPMG, I joined as a founding team. It was a startup. And in Graham Thornton also, when I joined in Bombay, it was growing. So it was a growing practice. So fundamentally, again, building a team, getting clients, doing transactions, uh, it was a very different opportunity. And, and, and then I guess I was very lucky. Our CEO was Vishesh, gave me the opportunity to, uh, to lead the Western region practice for the firm where I, where I led across practices, audit tax advisory. And I guess that's when the time, I still remember the advice I got from somebody that if you really want to create something or build uh, an organization, take people along, take people along with you. And I think that was a great advice. Uh, and I think, uh, as you can imagine, from a very technical person to doing so much of transactions, uh, this was a, a very different leadership role. So it was working with the partners for various age groups and really trying to come together as a team and one culture and then really build the practice. And, and I enjoyed that. Believe me, you know, a lot of people ask me, how do you do that? How did you do that every week? And, uh, you know, coming back every weekend to Bangalore. I think really a couple of things. I think my family supported that tremendously, my wife. And secondly, I think the people around me. And as you can imagine, Bombay is the financial capital of India. And it was really a great experience and a learning as a leader that how people are so different and binding them together. And that's when, you know, finally come now to be the national TMT sector leader. I still do transactions, private equity, and now listings for the firm. No, that's a phenomenal uh, Gary resume and journey. And I'm glad you brought it out. Audit, transaction advisory, MA, and IPR now, you've done so many deals, you know, valuations, you know, for a young finance professional, right? This is a career that they definitely want. Some of the skills needed for you to grow at every level. I want to discuss those skills, right? Uh, would you learn, like you said, you're a person who learned on the job? Uh, a lot of people. Uh, that's a better way. I'm, I'm a practical person myself. I would say learn on the job, uh, learn from your managers. But how did that happen to you? Happen to you? Did it grow organically, right? I mean, uh, if you can explain the process of how somebody should plan, plan that career path. What are the skills needed and how should one get there? No, I think it's a fantastic question. I, you know, <clears throat> at least for me, it was pretty much organic, right? Means, you know, I learned through the process. There were a lot of ups, a lot of downs. Uh, but I guess if I were to really think back and say, what's the one skill that is important? Uh, I would say the attitude of being curious learner, truly being curious learner, because, you know, you can read multiple books. You can talk to multiple people. You can do 300 transactions, but believe me, the thing that I learned from sports I think that's the thing that really stood out, which is the cricket pitch is going to be different every time. The bowler is going to be different. So focus on the ball, not on the bowler, if you're a batsman, which basically means that every situation is different. You cannot standardize it and say, I've learned it all and that's it. So I think being a curious learner uh, is the first skill. Uh, this, is, this is a lifelong journey, deal-making is a lifelong journey, you know? Uh, so I think that's the first skill I would say. I think you definitely need some solid technical finance skills. You definitely need that. What are those skills? I would say first as a chartered accountant, I think for a CA, you are very, very well suited to, to, be, to really be on the heart of deal making. Why? Because you're trained to be uh, detailed oriented, you're, you're trained to be what I call the professional skepticism. You know, you don't take everything on face value. So you, you, you kind of know what to kind of look at. Uh, so those skills are very good, right? Your, your, your accounting, tax, core finance skills, and some of these attributes. But I think you need a lot more, right? You just can't kind of just, just have that. I think in a deal-making process, right? If I were to just articulate, 
you know, it's first, it's a very important process for any company, right? You're spending high amount of dollars to buy an asset. And you just think about it from our perspective, if I were to buy a house, right? And it's very expensive house and you appoint an advisor, how would you deal with that? So another important skill is, is you got to be in the shoes of the buyer, your client is a seller or a buyer. You got to think from their perspective, not from your perspective. And I guess other skills like you need solid uh, analytical skills. I think that's number one. You need solid skills where you can uh, really play around with numbers, look at numbers and figure out what does a story look like, right? A business story look like. So the analytical skill is very important. Uh, actually, above the analytical skills, I would say the industry understanding skills and the sector, because what is relevant in a retail sector could be very different in a construction sector. What is relevant for the IT sector could be very different in the financial service. You've got to really understand the sector very well, the finance and the analytical skills. Third, I would say clarity of thought, very important. You can get muddled around. In, in this process. So you've got to have the ability to take a pause and take a step back and really figure out what's the purpose of the deal. So clarity of thought. And I would say uh, other couple of skills would be communication skills uh, because you have to present your thoughts clearly. You know, if you're doing a due diligence, you go to present your thoughts. What does it mean? You, you can't say, oh, this is a huge issue, but what does it mean for me? So you've got to have good communication skills. And I think finally, I would say solid people skills. Why? Because in a deal, right, you're dealing with a various number of people, right? Advisors, clients, sellers, and you're going to work collaboratively with a wider team. So you've got to kind of get those skills under your belt. Uh, but I believe uh, this is such a fascinating uh, practice. Uh, you know, once you get into this, you know, uh, you know. So I always say, your hands always twitch to get into the next next deal. Got it. That's uh, fantastic advice. I have a I have a little uh, example of uh, the modern era and how things are changing. Why CAs do not feel deterred by this? For example, Shark Tank is something that's very popular. Right. Uh, and, you know, once one, a founder said that a CA had valued the company, but the sharks or the founders there uh, give, give them very negative feedback saying, do you really believe a CA uh, understands valuation? Why is that CA needed? It's almost very detrimental. But when things like this get bandied around, uh, what advice would you give to chartered accountants who are aspiring to become chartered accountants rather? Uh, on how to go ahead when the situation is like that? Um, I think first is we got to break the myth that CAs are not involved on deal making. If you truly look at uh, the community, the deal makers community, right? Starting from m &A heads to CFOs, to CEOs, to advisors, financial advisors like us who do due diligences, we help to raise funds, uh, tax structuring, to commercial due diligence, the entire process to integration. There are so, so many brilliant professionals, top notch, who are actually chartered accountants. So many, first of all. So it's a myth to say that uh, CAs are not involved. And I'm not being biased here, having lived in this industry now uh, 20 odd years. Uh, there is a lot of CAs. But I think one perspective, right, is, as I said, just being a CA is not enough, right? CA is, is, is very important, right? But what do you do after that defines you as a person, as a deal maker. So fundamentally, I think you got to have an MBA type skill right, which is the ability to understand business. And I'll be candid with you, uh, 
maybe some of those aspects, you know, we are not possibly trained hard enough within the chart accountancy course. But as I said, if, some, if somebody does the articleship well, the training well, you already have so many things to come uh, to take on. So I think the business understanding is crucial. Uh, if the business understanding is good, you can really connect the dots. Coming to a question on valuations, I think first of all, valuation is, is a very subjective exercise. It's not something I can say, oh, this is an Excel model, this is the value. I can't because you know you think about it. I, can I place a value uh, on, on, on a bat uh, used by Sachin Tendulkar? Can I value it on Excel? I can't, right? For somebody, it could be millions of dollars. So valuation is a subjective uh, topic. Uh, CAs are extremely well positioned to value businesses. Most of the top accounting firms, including us, we have a market leading valuation practice and most of them happen to be chart accountants, a lot of them, including the a leader of the practice. Uh, so I would say that uh, it, is, it is a myth, uh, you know, the way CAs are positioned. Uh, but as I said, CA is not enough. There are other things that are required to be a good deal maker. That's amazing. Like you said, you can learn your CA if you've done your articles well, you have a business understanding. What shapes your career is a practical experience and curiosity in the uh, in the deal that you're in or in a company that you're at. That is uh, fantastically laid out. I also want to know from you, right? I mean, as a partner at Grant Thornton, what are some of the new areas that you see in the practice evolving? Uh, there are a lot of mid-sized firms who can learn a thing or two from you. What are some of the new areas of uh, practice that they can, you know, latch on to or add into their practice? I think, I think the last two years, uh, the I guess we all have changed, right? We all have changed. The ground rules have changed. Uh, the business opportunities have changed. Uh, so first is to accept that, that things are not going to be going back to the old days. It, it's clear. So if somebody believes that I can still do my audit in the good old fashion, I can still uh, do the due diligence in the good old fashion, uh, it's not going to happen because the world has changed. So I think first is accepting that uh, things are changed. What has changed? Uh, first of all, an often used word is digital transformation, right? In my view, it is business transformation, right? When you see an auto company, right? Moving into electric vehicle, uh, an auto platform company moving into manufacturing electric vehicles or a construction company, hardcore, moving into B2C e-commerce, that means business models are changing. So if business models are changing, I think for any firm, first is to understand the macro changes happening in the sectors. So for example, we know, right, tech companies is, is, is really uh, the play that we are seeing across the world, right? It's not, not in India. So you have the tech creators, you have the tech service providers, you have the tech platforms, then you have the startup and unicorn. So that's a huge ecosystem uh, that, is, that, is, that is getting built and that's going to get bigger and bigger. Uh, so first is understanding the landscape. From our perspective as Grand Thornton, we have incubated so many new practices and we believe that these are practices for the future. I'll give you some couple of examples uh, like ESG, right? The sustainability theme is very, very important. If you talk to any board, any company, sustainability is key, ESG is number one. So we've incubated ESG advisory. Digital and automation, digital consulting and automation. Any company today wants that, right? How do I transform my business digitally? How do I automate my processes? So that a big play is on digital consulting and transformation. Cyber, right? As we interact in this world, uh, the cybersecurity threats are real. So that's another big practice for us. And I, I would say, finally, would be listings, right? We are seeing uh, the biggest and the top listings globally that has happened. So, so listing advisory practice, uh, overseas listings, India listings. So these are the, some of the practices we've incubated. I guess for a mid-sized firm, it's very easy to do everything. Uh, 
but I would say it's, it's, it's possibly more important to be very focused, pick up one thing and make that success. So if you want to pick up cyber, really make it successful. You want to pick up ESG, make that successful. So not do too many things, but focus on one new area. Second, I would say a big theme is on your hybrid working and digital delivery model, right? Our delivery model is completely changed today, right? It's physical meetings, limited and digital meetings and how still you're delivering a high quality service. So work on your methodology and automation of your delivery. Uh, I think is the second key part I would want to give input for the mid-sized firms. And third is talent, right? So important because you can have the great practice, you can have the great methodology, but if you don't have the right talent, it's not time, right? So, so, so practice area, methodology, talent, and finally culture. So that's the new, new thing. I think the model that needs to come. Lovely. And, you know, finance professionals now have to understand three things. Web 3.0, blockchain, right? There's crypto. These are three things that are coming to the fore. Everybody talks, talks about them. Uh, firstly, do you see India heading in that direction? And do you think CAs should take this, these changes on the technology level seriously uh, and the underlying new asset, which is crypto? Yeah, means, I guess, Vishal, uh, means, you know, I think whether you're a CA or not a CA, I think all of us needs to learn and adapt to the digital world. That's number one. Second is the digital skills. So as you rightly said, I think things like artificial intelligence, blockchain, uh, RPA, right? Remote audits, uh, analytics. I think these are going to be very, very key skills for a chart accountant, right? Uh, so, so one has to adapt, right? Uh, second is also think about it, uh, you know, this will provide a huge opportunity for CAs, right? It's not just you will be only working in finance or in a profession. You could be working in, in the best BI company in the world, the business analytics and the business intelligence company in the world through your skills. So this also provides a, a fairly broader spectrum for CS to function. And as I said, I, I came back, I come back and I strongly believe that CS and tech needs to go hand in hand. For example, coding, right? One should not learn coding, for example. So, so some of those aspects, I guess, needs to get aligned. Uh, for finance. How did you stay up to date with these changes? Uh, I mean, do you read a lot or do you obviously meet a lot of technology companies, uh, advise them, of course. Uh, do you have a rule where you say, I wake up in the morning and learn about these things? Uh, how do you keep up to date with so much happening in tech? I think um, I go back to my mother. A very simple advice is focus. In the sense that uh, you can get distracted with what's happening around you, right? There is so much of tech, uh, so much of new jargons, um, and so much of new tools happening. Uh, so I, I actually uh, believe in that my mother's simple recipe and advice is focus. Uh, so one is uh, the focus on the fundamentals. So fine, you have a great digital tool, right? Fine, it's a new technology, but how is it relevant and aligned to my business objective? I think that's the key. So if I'm doing a business model, which is e-commerce, right? Uh, and I have a very fancy analytics tool, right? Where uh, it is laid over, which it can be good, but not really aligned to the business dynamics. The tool may not be relevant. So the point is, uh, I read a lot, to be honest. My books is is my favorite. So I, I, I definitely read a fair bit of uh, uh, books around tech, digital transformation, uh, stuff like that. So I do read a lot. Uh, I think the second is uh, I try to keep a uh, few people whom I call my tech mentors, right? Hardcore tech in the industry, 
and whom I keep dabbling with and just telling me, you know what, what is truly relevant. So just keep the distractions off and say, hey, you know what, AI is going to be really the future for uh, for retail, right? Let's kind of work on that. So, so I think keeping in tab with my tech mentors uh, and finally experts, right, within the firm, right? There's so many experts that we have within Grand Thornton on digital, on cyber, uh, just having a conversation uh, helps me uh, to keep it on. But, 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 but to be candid with you, it is so fast changing. Every day is, is, is a learning for me. That's fantastic. How do you handle the new generation when you hire, when knowing all these changes are happening? Uh, you know, how, how, what is the difference in the way they work? And what is it about them that you like? I think the first is the new generation you know, having interacted, they're just way, way more intelligent, tech savvy, and highly efficient is what I believe. They're highly, highly uh, skilled in so many ways, right? You know, if, if, if I compare with my days, you know, I was just a, a guy with like, you know, eyes popping, popping out and everything, everything was new. So, so, I think they're extremely bright to start with. Coming back to your question on, I guess, uh, adapting to them. Uh, I think more important, I would say, is, is a purpose, right? Uh, you know, for the new gen, whether it's finance or CA, I think purpose setting perhaps may be a little bit more relevant. Uh, because with so many choices today, right, for a finance professional, for a CA professional, right, we are getting so many captives getting set up in India. So the, you, you can imagine the demand of skills that will happen, not just in India, globally for finance. So the choices are, are huge today, right? Compensation, everybody's trying to woo you. But I think uh, the people who will make the difference are the people again, who will cut the distractions and come with a purpose. So, hey, I want to be one of the best in transactions and listings, right? It's a 20-year journey, 15-year journey. I'll get there in 10 years. I want to be there, right? Uh, and I think those are the people who will make a difference. Uh, and like, for example, firms like us, uh, we, we have a... Actually, it's in, in, in my view, I, I have a quote that we need non-transactional people in transaction services, non-transactional people. Because what we are looking out for is people who we can build trust with and who has a purpose, right? And, 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 and it's hard to be candid with you, Vishal. It's, it's very hard. Uh, but, uh, but what I believe in is what I believe in. So I think keeping a purpose and keeping a focus is pretty critical for the next year. Okay, now in conclusion, I want to ask you something for the finance professionals. Three things, three tech trends that they have to keep their view on in 2022. And what are your predictions of views for 2022? Yeah, I means for finance professionals, three tech trends, I think uh, I would say clearly first would be digital transformation, right? When I say digital transformation is not just as I said, it's often used, but, but the business transformation, which is getting impacted digitally. So you've got to keep very eye on how the businesses are changing. Uh, second, I would definitely say uh, things around uh, analytics uh, and, and drawing insights. So the data, the entire data game, right? So how do you really govern data, analyze data and get insight? So the data uh, uh, game. Uh, and lastly, I would say uh, AI and blockchain, right? AI is real. Blockchain is, is real. Uh, so I think these are the skills uh, for, for finance. What are the uh, views do you have for 2022? It can be economics, it can be political economy or whatever. What, what, I mean, knowing that the fact okay. that the world wants to come back uh, very soon and very fast. Yeah, I think, you know, it's been a hard two years from all of us, uh, you know, very different in various respects. But despite all that, 2021, for example, in the field that I work in on listings and transactions has been the best year globally and in India, the best year. 
believe me, we've never been that this busy in the last 20 years. It's, it's so much of activity. Means what for me? Means the desire of people to act. So there is activity. So they are not going to be sitting down, right? If investors are going to be investing, buyers are going to be buying and there's going to be listing happening. So activity is, is real. I feel 2022 uh, will be even higher activity. In fact, compared to 2021, as far as deals are concerned, listings are concerned, uh, businesses are concerned, more startups, more unicorns, more digital models. I think that part will be phenomenal. I think what will moderate are valuations and which is a good thing I feel. It's already happening, right? Uh, tech valuations, et cetera. I think valuations for new age companies perhaps would, may get moderated, which I think is a good thing. I think uh, COVID is not going to go. That's my feel. You're possibly not in a pandemic, but it's going to stay us. So it is going to be somewhat of disruption coming back, which means we've got to be all agile. Uh, but the fundamental thing, which again, uh, I believe, which if I were to sign off uh, something from my grandfather who said, uh, is really about positivity and hope, right? You look in front, not behind. You learn from your history, but you look in front. So I think positivity, I look with positivity and hope uh, that this is a great time for all individuals. If you're a CEO and a finance, the world is waiting for you. So you don't need to do anything, but, but that is the question, which means you need to skill yourself. And lastly, uh, as a professional, I would say, a value that I, it's, it's very close to my heart is on integrity. As Rabindranath Tagore said, that when the mind is without fear, and the head, head is held high. And that's the, I think, a path, uh, I guess we all, uh, at least I would like to walk in the future. That's fantastic. This has been a lovely interview, uh, Raja. Lovely insight. And I'm sure all of you watching this on the Finance Story have enjoyed this. By the way, this series is powered by Capita and it's called Finance 2022 and Beyond. This is Raja Lahiri, partner, Grant Thornton, Bharat, and we have loved this interview and I'm your host, Vishal Krishna. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.